Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. There's still some folks joining, um, but I thought we would get started on time and end on time to respect everybody's time. Thank you so much for joining us for our California State Parks Foundation Park Advocate webinar on the California State Budget and California State Parks. I am Rachel Norton. I'm the Executive Director of California State Parks Foundation. And we're just really excited to have you here with us today. And I'm excited to introduce our three speakers uh, in just a moment. So first, um, some reminders and housekeeping. Um, so we will, um, if you have questions during the, the presentation, you can use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom, and this slide shows you how, where it is uh, to type your question. We will try to get to as many questions as we can during the uh, live session, and questions that we're not able to get to, we will follow up with answers via email um, after the proposal. Please keep yourself on mute um, to limit distractions and uh, make sure everybody can focus on the presentation. Uh, and finally, uh, introduce yourself in the chat, uh, which is that you can see the chat window is different from the Q&A window, <laughs> um, but everyone can see the chat and uh, let us know who's here because it's fun to um, see, all, see all, everybody who is here since we can't all see each other. So during today's session, we're going to be going over the importance of advocating for state parks and giving you a um, overview on the governor's proposed budget and how the state budget process works generally, um, as well as what California State Parks Foundation sees as budget priorities um, for state parks this year. So uh, I'm really happy to be joined today by three amazing, smart, strategic advocates <laughs> um, for state parks. They are Bree Fordham, who is the executive director of Anza Borrego Foundation, Abigail Mile, who's an associate with environmental and energy consulting, and Dr. Emily Doyle, who is our own climate resilience program manager. So you'll be hearing from each of these folks. Hello, nice to see you all. <laughs> Uh, as the presentation moves on. But um, before we get to our speakers, um, I, I wanted to talk a little, start by talking a little bit about the importance of advocacy to a thriving state park system. And, you know, many of you are familiar with the history of California State Parks Foundation, and you know that we did not start out necessarily as an advocacy organization. We, over the years, however, saw that advocacy is a really essential component of our mission to protect and preserve the California state park system for the benefit of all. We've seen it again and again. Parks need an informed, engaged constituency to flourish. And the way that you build that constituency is through advocacy, educating the public, activating your supporters, and influ influencing policy and funding in the halls of power. So a decade ago, a different governor proposed closing almost a third of our state park system during uh, what was then a budget crisis. And we, you, all of us, used our voices and rose up for parks. And in fact, no parks closed as a result of our advocacy. It was a battle, yes, it was a battle, but the passion and the commitment from park advocates were key to successfully keeping parks open. Similarly, so many of you used your voices to keep the toll road from going through San Onofre State Beach, from keeping high transmission power lines from running through Anza Borrego State Park, um, and protecting parks from non-mission uses like these does not just happen. To beat back threats, vigilance, and people power is just crucial. So at California State Park Foundation, everything we do follows an intentional through line that starts with learn. We develop a deep understanding of the significant issues that are facing the park system, and we monitor current trends in the environment space, in the social justice space, and the park space. 
Next, we educate to develop a diverse and informed and engaged constituency of individuals and partners. And then we activate that constituency, that base of park supporters to be champions for parks. Finally, we influence, we create change by connecting all of the learning that we've got derived in the field from our constituencies from all over the system um, and use those learnings to uh, inform policy solutions in the halls of power where decisions are made. So one example uh, that's a good example of how this works is our Pathways to Parks initiative, which um, we started back in 2018 with LEARN. We worked with UCLA and developed some research that told us um, that 57% of Californians, almost 22 million people, live within a short walk, bike ride, or drive of state parks. And that was important because then we knew that the constituency, potential constituency for state parks was much larger um, than anecdotally who we knew were regularly using state parks. So we took those learnings and with the strong support of California's first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, we began to build a movement for expanding park access. And uh, many of you participated in that, uh, used your voices, advocated for um, ways of lowering barriers to visiting parks. And in 2021, we were so excited that three pilot programs um, for park access were funded in the state budget. Uh, and those are, many of you already know, the Golden Bear Pass, which um, expanding access to the Golden Bear Pass, which provides access for very low income Californians to state parks, uh, the Adventure Pass, which is modeled on the Every Kid Outdoors uh, National Park Pass that allows fourth uh, graders and their families access to 19 state parks for free during the year that they're in fourth grade. Uh, and then finally, the State Library Parks Pass, which makes uh, state park passes available for checkout at every public library in the state of California. So going forward, now we have these pilots, our job is to develop really good information on how they've expanded access to the state park system and start to fight for additional funding for those passes uh, once the pilot programs expire next year. So. That's kind of next year's problem, although we're already starting to think about it and work on it. Um, but in the meantime, we have this year's problem. And we're going to hear more about this from Abigail in a minute. Um, but I'll just sort of frame it by saying that the challenge in California is that our state budget kind of lurches from uh, feast to famine. <laughs> so we just came off of two amazing years in 2021 and 2022, where we saw huge budget surpluses. Um, and now, not so much. <laughs> so uh, this is really a challenge for state parks, and it's a challenge for other agencies as well, because um, what it means in practical terms is that in the good years, they have to be ready to ramp up very quickly to spend often one-time money, um, and then things turn quickly again, and they have to ramp back down. So uh, I'm really excited uh, to introduce Abigail Mile, <laughs> who is going to provide us with a lot more details on how this looks, the outlook looks today in Sacramento and the budget that um, the governor proposed. And uh, Abigail is an associate with Environmental and Energy Consulting in Sacramento, which is the firm that California State Parks Foundation employs as our contract lobbyist. Abigail specializes in land conservation, environmental equity, and climate policy at EUC, and specifically she helps clients, definitely has helped us, clearly define their funding and policy goals and supports them in realizing these goals. Uh, prior to working at EEC, she specialized in policy research, covering a range of resource equity issues. Uh, including authoring a comprehensive assessment in 2020 of drinking water quality across California, identifying vulnerable populations, and proposing policy changes to accept, to address gaps in access. Um, 
before this, Abigail gained policy and advocacy experience through internships with the Local Government Commission and the Office of Assembly Member Cecilia Aguiar Curry and graduated with a, PA, a BA in Political Science and History from UC Davis. So, Abigail, take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Rachel. And essentially, yes, Abigail Mile, nice to, to see you all here. Um, basically, what I get to do is be a full-time parks advocate here in Sacramento, which I love doing. Um, so with all of that, I'm here to just tell you a little bit more about the background of how Parks is funded, uh, the mechanisms that go into supporting these programs that you all want to support, and where we stand this year as far as the state budget goes and, and Parks funding overall, where we need advocacy. So before we get into the specifics of what was included in this year's budget proposal and the specific items we're going to be advocating around over the next couple of months, uh, I did. I wanted to back up and just kind of lay out where Parks gets its funding generally. Uh, there, there are multiple different sources to look at here, and I think we might have a slide about that. Perfect. So California State Parks are funded through really three main sources on a regular basis. That's general fund, user fees, and special funds. Uh, and then there's a fourth occasional uh, source of funding of statewide bonds when they are passed and funded at the state level. Um, so what each of these mean are, first of all, general fund is typically the largest contributor, contributor to state parks funding uh, year to year. And this pot of funding, parks heavily depends on it, but it fluctuates. As Rachel was saying, there's kind of a feast and famine pattern. Last year, we had close to $100 billion surplus from some federal assistance, from a huge influx in personal income taxes, and just overall, the, the state of the economy last year was, you know, was, was boosting up our revenues. And then this year, we're now facing a, anywhere between $18 and, and $25 billion budget deficit. So it's really hard to see where it's going to go to year, year to year. And while the general fund provides a huge bulk of state parks funding, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell where we stand. And then the other sources of funding that state parks really relies on would, of course, be user fees. So these are camping, admission fees, day use, and concession rents. All of these things go into the State Parks and Recreation Fund, which is a special fund, and supports uh, parks operations and programs on an ongoing basis. And there are other special funds as well, although none of them make up quite as much of the of the of the pot as the state parks and recreation fund. Uh, but there's the off highway vehicle trust, the environmental license plate fund, and a number of other special funds that either in whole or in part funnel to the state parks budget every year. And then finally, we have statewide bonds. So. Like I said, bonds are a fourth and, and less consistent source of funding for state parks. Uh, over the years, the states passed a number of statewide bonds that include funding for conservation and parks issues in general, uh, some of which is then given directly to parks. For example, Proposition 68 back in 2018 was passed. It's a statewide bond that set aside roughly a billion dollars for parks and outdoor access programs and issues. Uh, but by this point, a short five years later, all of that funding is almost all used up. It's already been appropriated and spent. And so until another bond comes along, um, that, that's not going to be a substantial source of funding for parks. So those are the four main pots that, that we're drawing from here. And with that, uh, I'll get into a little bit more of, of the situation that we're, we find ourselves in right now at the state level. So here we are, January 19th, nine days ago on the 10th, uh, the governor released his annual January budget proposal, which kind of kicks off the six month long budget negotiation process between the administration, the governor, um, the Senate and the assembly. And they're gonna go back and forth until about June, which I'll, I'll go over here in a minute, the specific dates uh, that, that really matter for budget advocacy. Uh, but we basically saw what the governor intends to do with the budget and how he, how he plans to influence it this year. Uh, and like I mentioned before, there's a there's a lot of change year to year. So we went from the last two years in 2021 and 22 with huge, uh, almost $100 billion surpluses, during which the governor proposed a historic budget package for climate and parks and outdoor access. 
uh, kind of all bundled together, it was $54 billion for all of these investments over a five-year period, which was more than the state had ever invested in, in our causes before. It was very exciting to see. But now, as it turns out, now as it's projecting for this year, we have about a $20 billion deficit. Um, and to respond to this, the new proposal, instead of relying on rainy day funds or, or cutting from um, the, the reserves that we've built up, the governor has proposed to make select cuts and fund deferrals for the next couple of years to a, to a number of sectors to make up for this gap that we have. And some of those cuts ended up being from the natural resources sector, from that $54 billion that they had outlined for climate. And unfortunately, some of them were to parks specifically. Um, but I'll go through right now and kind of outline some of the, the highlights and maybe some of the lowlights that we saw in the governor's proposal last week. Um, so for one, a, a wonderful you know, allocation that we saw pop up last week was $5.8 million to support the Dos Rios Ranch State Park opening and staffing support over the next couple of years. So they, uh, they would get $5.8 million this year and then roughly $3 million going forward to support operations and like I said, staffing and, and just making that park everything that we hope it can be. Um, so that was very exciting to see. Um, another thing that was included was, if you recall, a couple of years ago and for the past several years, there's been a lot of advocacy around deferred maintenance funding for state parks and making sure that while we work on access programs and while we work on new state parks, we're making sure that all of the parks that are already open are providing a good visitor experience and that they're kept you know, tip top shape and beautiful and maintained. We, you know, obviously that's what we work for every year. So two years ago, um, the state gave the Department of Parks and Recreation $185 million to address some of the backlog in deferred maintenance projects, which was, was an encouraging start. Didn't quite cover everything, <laughs> nowhere close to covering everything, but it was a great start. Unfortunately, not all of that has been spent in the last two years. And so in this year's budget, the governor has proposed to grab uh, the $31 million of that $185 million allocation, pull it back um, and, and see where we stand in the future to, to try and close this deficit gap. Uh, and that, that was one of the main things we want to talk about and making sure we're advocating around trying to trying to express the need for that money and get it back to get refunded deferred maintenance. Um, we'd love to see it funded above and beyond that number. And then a couple other things I would highlight from the governor's proposal would be um, the statewide parks program that focuses on local park development across the state. So over the last couple of years, it was awarded $380 million, which was super exciting. Um, and this year, to address part of the deficit, the governor's proposed to grab back $150 million of that. Still leaves a good amount of funding, still leaves $230 million. Um, but we're hopeful that we can try and see some of that $150 million restored based on the, uh, the budget condition in the next couple of years. And then a couple of other things that I, I wanna highlight despite a couple of cuts to important state parks programs uh, would be all the things that we did hang on to from the $54 billion package that was passed over the last couple of years. And that is, as Rachel mentioned, the state library pass program that received $13.5 million last year that has remained in the budget. Uh, two years ago, there was a $12 million allocation for sea level rise adaptation at state parks, um, which we were happy to see remain in the budget. And then finally, the very the awesome outdoor equity grants program, uh, which received $75 million over a three year period that has also stayed in the budget. So there are a lot of great things that remain um, in the proposal. And a lot of what we're going to be advocating around this year is going to be hanging on to those things and demonstrating the need for, yes, these wonderful programs, uh, park development, sea level rise adaptation, but also, you know, highlighting the need for more deferred maintenance and re, you know, re-underscoring the need for support for the programs that were cut in the, in the proposed budget. So that's a little bit of an overview of what we saw uh, last week from the governor and uh, kind of what we're dealing with heading into a six month long budget negotiation process uh, and, and what we'll be prioritizing, which I'll get into more a little bit later.
Thank you, Abigail. That was a great overview. Um, and we're getting a few questions in the chat. I think one um, that you can probably answer pretty easily is, um, Rob would like to know if bonds are paid back from parks general allocation, meaning a penalty or from some other source. Um, and I believe it's general fund, isn't it? Yeah, we use general fund to pay back all of our bonds. Yeah, so it's not, it, it, it reduces the amount of gen, unrestricted general fund that's available for parks, but it doesn't uh, take specifically away from parks. It is borrowing, so you're paying an interest rate on that money, it's true, um, but it is a good, bonds have been a great way that the state parks um, system has built projects in the past. So uh, Andrea would like to, is asking um, what I believe is about Prop 21, I think she's referring to Prop 21, that uh, there was a ballot measure that would have opened all state parks, uh, all parks to all state members. Um, what about trying that one again with a possibly lower rate? <laughs> Care to comment on uh, Prop 21 and, the, and its uh, possibilities in the future? You know, I think that it's been something that has been discussed for about a decade. You know, obviously everyone was very excited about that prospect. Um, and I hope it's something we can revisit in the future. Mm -hmm. It's probability of success. It's hard to speak on right now, but. Right, right. I, I'll love and to for those who aren't um, familiar, Prop 21 uh, would have made all state parks free. And in exchange, um, I believe it was a $19 fee on the vehicle registration. I can't remember exactly the size of the fee, but um, you know that was going to replace the entry fees for Californians. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it went to the ballot and did not succeed. Um, people don't like license fees in California. So um, it is a, it's a tough hill to climb, which is why it hasn't been attempted again, but it does get talked about, uh, periodically and, um, you never say never, you just have to look for the right time and, um, for something like this, but it is a big, we had to put it on with signatures, which is a pretty heavy lift. So, uh, not an easy undertaking, I would say. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, Andrea has a question um, about uh, have the state library park passes been used? And I can answer that one, which is that yes, they have, they're wildly popular. Um, and Abigail mentioned the $13.5 million we got last year. That was in addition to um, a couple million that was provided as part of the 2021 package that I was talking about. And the reason why the Library Parks Pass got such a big infusion of new cash is that it's wildly popular. And um, there were you know, wait lists at libraries, so they wanted to expand the number of passes in circulation. Um, and we are actually um, helping state parks uh, administer the, uh, the survey and the incentive for filling out the survey. So if you check out a pass you, and fill out a survey about your experience, um, you get entered into a, a drawing to win a state parks pass from us. And um, we're just getting tremendous data and um, response from Californians. People really like that program. And um, it's it's doing exactly what it was intended to do. It is bringing people who otherwise have not visited state parks into the state park system um, for the first time. And for those of us who know that to love these places, you need exposure to these places. Um, that's exactly you know, what we were trying to accomplish. So it's really exciting. Um, okay, so I think that is all the questions for now. Um, Abigail, do you wanna um, talk now a little bit about the process and how that six month negotiation is gonna play out? Yes, I actually, I see one more that I oh. maybe touched on real quick and I'll just add a little bit. I think Sonia asked about these trigger restorations. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'll just take a quick second to, to, to explain that, Sonia. But yes, as part of the governor's proposed cuts, um, 3.9 billion of the cuts that he made are trigger restorations, meaning they're cut for now. If we have adequate general fund in January 2024, all of them will be restored. Um, so uh, how that interacts with the parks budget proposal this year is, is that only the proposed cuts to the statewide parks program, the local parks program, 
um, would would be part of those trigger restorations. So unfortunately, the, the deferred maintenance cuts that were proposed would not be restored if that trigger is pulled in January 2024. I hope that clarifies. Mm -hmm. And and just to answer Carol's question, um, the outdoor equity grant funds are fully funded, um, and that's a bright spot in this budget that they did not get cut. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I'll I'll turn now to talk a little bit more specifically about budget advocacy, specific dates, and, and the process, and and how folks can engage uh, to support all of these things that we just talked about uh, and support parks funding. So as I mentioned, January 10th, so last week, uh, the governor released his proposed budget for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. Um, and like I mentioned, this kicks off the budget negotiation process between the three parties, both houses of the legislature and the governor. Um, what happens right now in the couple of weeks following that proposal is that the legislative budget committees in the Senate and Assembly will convene, they'll review all of the governor's proposals uh, and deliberate. That also provides an opportunity for public engagement. So there, there are multiple ways for the public to engage there. You can go to the, the open to the public budget committee meetings and you know, state comments on the governor's proposal, urge the legislature to make different decisions. Um, you can contact the governor's office directly and advocate that way or contact uh, your legislative representatives directly as well. So between January and April, there's a lot of back and forth between all of the parties and it's a really great time to be engaging. The next big milestone, big date in the budget process is May 14th. So this is essentially when the governor looks at what his proposal was in January, uh, considers all of the deliberations and feedback from the legislature and the public over the last four months, and then also looks at uh, tax incomes and, and revenues and, and where the state stands as far as general fund dollars after tax day, um, and then releases a revised proposal. So it's really just redoing what he did in January, more informed, uh, and we'll see kind of a better idea of what the governor and the two legislative houses have, have been discussing. And then between, um, well, I'll say, uh, the, the same process repeats again after the, the May revision is released. So budget committees meet, there's opportunity for public engagement, um, and then the legislative houses will look at what they had proposed in response to the January budget. They'll look at the governor's revised May budget, uh, and they'll do their, their final deliberating amongst themselves. Um, that sometimes involves a conference committee between the two houses. So if they have different outcomes and different visions for what they want the budget to be and for specific items, um, they'll form a committee with three members from each house and they'll deliberate on the, their differences there. That unfortunately is not open for public engagement, um, but it's an important step in the legislative process when it does happen. And then all of this leads up to June 15th which is a constitutional deadline by which the legislature has to pass a budget bill uh, by midnight. So they got to draw their conclusions and hopefully all of the um, engagement and advocacy up to that point has been done. And then they release the budget bill, which then gives the governor 12 days to sign it into law um, to be ready for the beginning of the fiscal year on July 1st. So I would reference a couple of things to consider here. In the last two years where we've had these huge budget surpluses, um, it's been a little, a little funky. So we've had this typical um, order of engagement and then deliberations continue throughout the summer because there's this huge surplus. The, the legislature passes a budget bill, but then they add on a budget bill junior, a trailer bill. They're, they're kind of extra budget bills after they've met their constitutional requirement. So then we get two to three extra months of engagement um, and deliberation, deciding what to do with the, the, the excess uh, revenue. This year, as, as we've talked about, it's not looking like we'll have a surplus. In fact, it's looking like we'll have quite a, quite a large deficit. Um, so we don't expect that to happen. We expect everything to take place between now and June um, as far as settling budget discussions. So it really is the key six months to stay engaged, especially following the, the January proposal uh, and following the release of the May revise in a couple of months. Great. 
Well, thank you, Abigail. Um, as we can see, there's a lot of opportunities to influence the process going forward, and it is, um, you know, it is a process, so <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, so a couple other questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A. Um, so one is from Colleen, um, and she's asking whether park operators receive funding when people use the library park passes. I, I'm going to probably need to follow up with you directly on that, Colleen. What, what I understand, that funding that you know, has been allocated to pay for um, the passes is in part due to replace any lost revenues. And obviously for park operators, you know, that is a, the gate is really an important part of your income. So um, my understanding is yes, but I don't know. Um, I see you nodding, Bree. I don't know if that's something that you have any knowledge of. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll follow up. Not sure. But I, I, I expect that there is some um, way of making operators whole for any lost income um, at the gate for people using passes and that that's part of the funding. Um, and then Elise asked uh, if there'd been much damage to park roads and structures in the recent floods. And yes, I think if he's not there right now, he's going to be there soon. Uh, President Biden is actually going to be at Seacliff uh, State Beach today, which in Santa Cruz, which um, got a lot of damage. Um, but the, the important thing to remember about that is that um, the, a lot of the immediate storm damage, because of the emergency dec declaration that the governor and the feds did, um, there will be FEMA funding available for them to, um, to fix some of those. So it doesn't immediately add to the total of deferred maintenance backlog, the things that need to be fixed. There will be additional resources that'll be coming for um, emergency relief from FEMA. So that's, that's good news. Um, and then um, uh, Abigail Betsy is asking, uh, didn't we set aside some of our surplus? Will those funds help with the budget deficit? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so we did set aside a large amount of the surplus from last year. Um, we, we didn't just assign it all to one-time expenditures and, and call it a day. We made some pretty considerable investments in our rainy day funds and reserves. Um, however, out of what the governor is saying, uh, an abundance of caution of future economic conditions, right now we're not making the first step to rely just on reserves and rainy day funds um, to, to make up for the current deficit. So instead of just dipping into our savings, uh, he's proposing some strategic cuts to make sure that we're not spending so heavily if we're in a deficit. And then should general fund recover, we'll restore those you know, spending pots, and should it not recover and things actually take a turn for the worst, then we'll we'll still have those reserves and the rainy day funds in good shape to rely on in the future. Um, so there's another um, uh, question that's quite technical, but you may know the answer to this, uh, Abigail from Al Henning. It's it's my understanding that once the legislature passes a bill and sends it to the governor's office for signature, that the governor can add specific items to the bill without further review from the legislature. Um, and he has um, an ex a specific um, example uh, from the Off Highway Motor Vehicle Fund uh, in September 2021. Is my understanding of this process correct, or does the legislature exercise final review and approval of the state budget? So the the one power that the governor has, I mean, obviously he doesn't have to sign the budget. He he really he usually does sign the budget. Uh, he doesn't have to. That's the power he has. Or when it goes to the governor's desk, um, he has the power to basically do a line item veto in that budget. So he can reduce or eliminate any specific item in the budget that the legislature sends to to his desk. Um, I I do I would have to look into whether moving funds from one fund to another. Uh, it lies within that power. Uh, that's kind of a specific situation. Um, but I don't believe he has the power to to add additional funding without sign off from the legislature first. Um, it's just that that reduction or elimination power. Oh, right. And this is I think this is about the payment that was um, negotiated around the Tesla property. I think yeah, that's he's true. referring to. Yeah. Um, 
so that was a, yeah, I, well, that's a good enough answer. You know, more than I do, <laughs> but that, that was a pretty unique situation too, when that happened. Um, okay. So Abigail, uh, handing back off to you, do you want to talk about sort of what we're, um, prioritizing? Yeah, definitely. So that was a lot of information that I just covered about the specifics and, and details of how the budget works. Um, but now I, I just want to talk about specifically what California State Parks Foundation and, and us here in Sacramento are going to be really focusing on this year, considering our budget situation. Um, so first of all, we'd really like to see the $31 million cut to the deferred maintenance pot restored. Ideally, I think we'd like to see it expanded upon, uh, but considering we're in a deficit year, I think making sure that we're advocating around a visitor experience, park quality of our parks, um, and, and making sure we're maintaining all these wonderful spaces that we have is going to be a top priority. Uh, so we'd like to, to have the legislature challenge the governor's suggestion to, to make that cut. We'd also like to make sure that we're holding on to the proposed new funding for Dos Rios Ranch State Park. Um, so there's that $5.8 million and 3.3 ongoing to support staffing and maintenance, et cetera. Um, and we wanna make sure we see that happen. We'd love to see that open and, and you know be in great shape. So we're gonna be focusing a lot of energy around that. And then finally, and this kind of applies to multiple different items, but we'd like to hold on to what we got in previous budget years for state parks that has not been cut and, and that's still there. So we want to make sure we're, you know, really displaying the value and the need for the funding for the outdoor equity program, the remaining funding for the state parks program, the local parks program, um, and especially the, the $12 million that state parks got in 2021 to support sea level rise adaptation. Um, there are a couple of other items that remain in the budget to support parks, but I think those are three main ones that we really want to just rally around and, and show that we, we need to keep those in whatever budget is passed this year. Great. Um, well, so now I'm really excited uh, to introduce Bree Fordham, who is the executive director of the Anza Borrego Foundation, which is the nonprofit partner of Anza Borrego Desert State Park. Bree has been with the Anza Borrego Foundation since 2014, serving both in development and leadership to support the unique needs of Anza Borrego. It is the largest park in the system at nearly 650,000 acres. Um, and one of the most resource rich and underfunded for its needs. So um, we asked Bree to talk about her, what that looks like on the ground, because that is the illustration of the deferred maintenance problem. <laughs> um, so before I, so I'm not going to editorialize anymore. I'm going to hand it off to Bree. Great, thank you for having me, Rachel. Um, and Abigail, thank you so much for all the detail and overview. Um, you know, it's it's a complex system as you can see, and I really appreciate the perspective of being able to see, um, you know, the sort of the cogs and the machinery behind how this all works, because it's certainly a lot different when you're standing on the ground um, looking at a pothole or um, a broken facility or, you know, a closed gate um, and how you can make change in that moment. Um, a lot of people don't see what's happening uh, sort of behind the curtain. So I'm happy to um, bring my experience to all of you here today. Um, I, I'll start by saying I'm certainly not the expert. Um, I have um, a very um, unique experience um, in my position as the executive director um, and park partner to Anza Borrego, I work very closely with uh, the park uh, district superintendent. Uh, we have a great relationship and um, a long holding partnership. We've been partnering with the park for over 55 years um, and we've had many successes. Um, and I think uh, maintenance is an area as a partner that um, is a gray area. It's really hard to support the park in this area because um, we have bureaucratic uh, challenges and we can't hold the same types of contracts. Um, we can't necessarily raise money for deferred maintenance. So it's critical for us to support the park in these other advocacy ways um, to, to build funds and make sure that the park can be supported. Um, and, you know, and, and just another sort of just broader perspective on this is that 
a lot of people who come to the park and see um, you know, that they can't have access to something or that something is not working or they'd like to see an improvement. Um, a lot of people who visit the park will come to us and ask, what are we doing about it? Um, and so it's, it's a frustration for us when we feel like we can't answer that question. Um, you know, even if we had the money to help, we, we may not be able to fix that problem. Um, so there's a couple different ways that I think we approach this. Um, we, we work closely with the park and understanding what deferred maintenance projects are there and which ones can we help with? Um, and, and in my working with the, the district superintendent, I'm, I'm really learning um, the unique challenges of deferred maintenance. Um, and, and it's really, it's a two part system. It's, um, it's also focusing on routine maintenance, which is not allowing some of these infrastructures to get to deferred maintenance. Um, and then there's deferred maintenance. Um, and that's, that's something that where, you know, where do you put your money um, in that sort of circular equation of um, supporting these facilities? Um, Anza Borrego Desert State Park also has, you know, a very unique list of deferred maintenance um, issues that don't just include bathrooms and um, campground facilities. We have natural and cultural sites. Um, we have laboratories. Um, so our list is quite dynamic. Um, and we're always looking at health and safety first, um, health and safety of the visitor, um, of the park user. And then we're looking at, you um, you know, what's the going to be the best use of the funds for protecting that investment, so not letting it get to deferred maintenance. Um, so it's, I really have to give um, uh, props to the state park uh, folks. They are constantly being innovative and creative about how they can shuffle funds around in a limited deferred maintenance budget. Um, I can't express to you how important deferred maintenance budget is, and to see that um, it would be cut even further, knowing that the amount that's been allotted to it um, really just scratches the surface on keeping things going. Um, it's a it's a critical issue. Um, you know, I I really feel that the governor and all of state parks is doing their absolute best in taking approaches to a very challenging and dynamic natural system to keep up with it. Um, you know, we look at that this year we need to pull back um, and that we're going to have a deficit. But here we are in the middle of massive rains and wildflowers popping up everywhere and visitation is about to increase. And we have facility issues that will not meet the demands of those visitor needs. Um, how do we accommodate for that? You know, um, on the ground, we step in and we order porta potties. Um, we offer extra um, visitor needs on top of what the park needs to almost respond at a, like an emergency status level that might not be elevated to an emergency status at a state level. But we work closely with the park to say, you know, what can we do to make sure that we're not going to further crumble the system or give that visitor a, a poor experience? So. Um, this is where our partners really need to step in, where there's sort of these unintended consequences of not funding these deferred maintenance issues. It's extremely dynamic, you know. Um, just for an example, Anza Borrego has more than 200 deferred maintenance projects on a list. Um, we're one of the largest parks, but we're also one of the parks that has... Um, volume wise, not as many facilities that need to be addressed. So there are other parks that have more intense facility maintenance. Um, we also are, you know, sort of third from the bottom as far as um, not being funded um, at an adequate level. So I know that that's just our profile. When we look at other parks, I mean, it's not a one size fits all situation for the needs of each one of these parks. Um, and certainly, um, you know, putting the priority of safety for the park visitor, um, people are making really hard decisions on the ground floor um, in a system that's totally dynamic that you can't um, forecast for. So um, I, you know, I, I'm happy to answer any more specific questions about our park to shed light on sort of how critical it is that we really have a voice about deferred maintenance, but also May, uh, not just deferred maintenance, but maintaining the projects and the investments that we already have. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this and that, you know, it's not just money that will solve this problem. Um, it's a web 
um, that creates these beautiful parks. Um, it's personnel, it's the hiring process, it's capacity as well. I mean, if we look at, you know, Anzabrago has 200 projects, uh, we're not gonna get those done in a year. It'd probably take us several years to do that. So even if we give it all the money that it needs, we're still gonna be disappointed standing at the park saying, why isn't this fixed? Um, so we have to adjust our expectations about what more money will do. And that's not to argue that we don't need more money, but. Um, I think we all need to understand it's a very dynamic situation. So um, I just, I appreciate the platform to speak a little bit more in detail about how dynamic this is and appreciate everyone being uh, behind this measure to make sure that we don't see further cuts in this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and we need to move on, but I, I just wanna say, cause I, I can talk a lot about deferred maintenance now, but one of the things that seems more and more clear to me is that Feast or famine is not working for the sort of sustained maintenance and uh, fixing things that are broken in park. So, you know, it's great to get 185 million in one year, but not if the next year you get nothing and the year after that you lose 31 million. <laughs> so, you know, so sustained investment is more and more what I think we're going to be talking about. It's not so much, there's always going to be a backlog of projects. Like to your point, you can't do 200 projects in one year, but, um, but you can chip away at the problem and invest in it in a sustained way so that it doesn't get worse. Um, and eventually, you know, you can kind of get ahead of it so that things don't break as quickly and get on the deferred list. They just stay on the maintain list. Um, thank you, Bree. Really helpful to hear from you. Thanks. My so pleasure. Much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Dr. Emily Doyle, who is our program manager for climate resilience at California State Parks Foundation. And we wanted Emily, Emily, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her background as a climate science. She has a PhD that she just received from uh, uh, Cambridge. Um, but we wanted Emily to really talk to you about like, what is, what is the climate impact that we're seeing in state parks and what are some of the solutions that are gonna be required for those impacts um, for investment? So, but I'll just tell you, Emily is a climate scientist with a background in polar research and analytical chemistry. She's a California native um, and it, it uses her experience here at California State Parks Foundation to support climate resiliency in state parks. Uh, she has a master's degree in geoscience. And as I mentioned, her PhD in earth sciences at Cambridge, she recently completed. Um, at Cambridge, she reconstructed climate processes through the chemical analysis of Antarctic ice cores. And you can see Antarctica a little behind her on her <laughs> screen. Uh, and during her graduate work, she produced the first seasonal record of sulfur climate signals in Antarctica and studied past ice shelf collapse in West Antarctica due to the warming climate. So Emily, take it away. Great, well, thanks for that introduction, Rachel. Um, so today I'm just gonna tell you about a couple of the main climate threats and priorities that we have for state parks in this coming year. And I don't think it would take anyone by surprise that the two major ones that we are focusing on is sea level rise and wildfires. So I'll just go through each of these briefly. Um, so sea level rise is obviously a priority for state parks, which make up um, about a quarter of California's coastline. So state parks will play a significant role in the state's overall response to sea level rise damage that's currently happening. Um, and at this rate could exceed one meter by the end of the century. So higher sea levels combined with other effects of climate change are increasing storm damage, increasing flood risk, destroying infrastructure. And unfortunately we've seen the extreme damage that can be caused in the storms that just happened this past week. And as a Capitola native who used to always visit Seacliff State Beach, um, that hits particularly hard. So action really need, we really need to take action on this um, important issue. And to do so, State Parks has actually published a sea level rise adaptation strategy that came out in 2021. However, now they really need the support to implement the details of that plan in order to accomplish their goal, which is to prepare for 3.5 feet of sea level rise by 2050. And this support includes things like um, the ability to hire staff to complete vulnerability surveys, and building databases, which allows them to share sea level and adaptation data between all parks. Because the, um, 
So the overall goal is really to identify and implement a consistent adaptation plan across the state. In order for adaptation measures to be truly successful, they need to be coordinated. If you end up with kind of a patchwork response um, at all different locations, you're much less successful at creating consistent, successful sea level rise adaptation measures. So right now is a really significant point in state park sea level rise adaptation work. They're really trying to drive this program forward and grow these climate resilience efforts. So this is a really key priority that um, we can focus on and show support for. And secondly, wildfires. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that wildfires are a dire threat facing all of California, including state parks since 2020, which is actually the worst fire season in California's recorded history. Over 7 million acres of California have burned, and unfortunately, this includes 97% of Big Basin Redwood State Park in 2020, which is actually the first state park that was established. And these catastrophic wildfires are a direct, direct result of climate change, which is accelerating both the frequency and intensity of these fires. And it's the combination of climate change and the effects of years of fire exclusion which has allowed dead trees, shrubs, other potential wildfire, wildfire fuel to really build up over, for over 100 years now and kind of turn our forests into tinderboxes, essentially. So in order to address this, state parks really need support for large-scale forest management projects. This includes um, fuel reduction programs like selective tree thinning or prescribed burns, which is considered one of the most effective methods of improving wildfire resilience. And state parks is currently undertaking these efforts on a relatively smaller scale. Um, for example, they've done prescribed burns this past year at uh, Montaña de Oro and Calaveras Big Trees um, and others. However, every year these, the, these projects, it's only happening maybe around several thousand acres a year. And in order to have a significant, successful, long lasting impact in building wildfire resilience in state parks, these programs really need to be scaled up. So this is an area that they could really use a lot of support. Um, eventually, they're going to want to be doing prescribed burns tens of thousands of acres every year, which is what's really essential in order to accomplish long-term climate resiliency. So this is another area that um, we can really focus on and provide support in the future. And with that, um, I'll hand it back. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. It is so great to have Emily on board. Um, she's really deepened our understanding of what's possible and what the science is telling us and um, just has been a great addition to the team. So thank you, Emily. Um, Abigail, let me uh, turn it back to you. So do you want to talk about the client, the governor's climate package, and maybe you can touch on um, uh, sort of what the forest management piece is, because we have a question about that in the Q&A, um, as well as other aspects of the climate package. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, I would love to. So uh, I mentioned a little bit previously, but over the past two years, the, you know, the, the state passed a $54 billion climate package, which included nature-based solutions, wildfire, um, coastal resilience, and then a number of other, of other items from uh, electrification to greenhouse gas emission reductions, all of that. Uh, so that huge $54 billion package now in this year with the deficit is, is seeing a $6 billion cut proposed to it. Um, so that, that would lower it to $48 billion. Um, but there are a number of items within that $48 billion for state parks that, that are still in, in the budget. So to touch a little bit on the, the fuel reduction, which I know someone asked a question about last year, um, the, the budget included $20 million for um, wildfire resilience and state parks specifically. And that has remained in the budget. So that, that is staying there and, and hopefully that can be put to some good use over the next couple of years. It has a several year encumbrance period. Um, but basically where we're at right now is we're seeing these proposed cuts to the climate package and we're organizing ourselves to go advocate for the specific items that we really need to see come through for parks. Um, and, and again, I'll reiterate that's keeping the money for sea level rise, keeping the money for wildfire resilience, and hopefully restoring the money for um, deferred maintenance in our state parks. 
Uh, so that's going to be a, a six month long process. That's going to be a lot of, of action alerts and advocacy to, to the legislature, to the governor and all of that. Um, but we'd really like to, to ensure that this temporary deficit does not have long lasting impacts on our ability to you know, be restoring and protecting our parks. Great. Um, well, thank you all. Um, we have a couple of other questions um, in the chat that maybe we can address. Um, specifically, um, let's see. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna address. Well, so first, Alan is asking about how funds are prioritized for repairs at locations like Carpentria State Beach. Not familiar with that particular situation at Carpinteria. I think, you know, everything as far as what, what projects are, are prioritized in state parks um, starts with the general plan. So um, you mentioned that the approach might be to reduce the number of campsites rather than rebuilding seawalls. Um, you know, generally, I, again, don't know if this is the situation at Carpinteria, but Emily, I mean, generally seawalls are not really a, a great solution for sea level rise, right? You want to talk about that for a minute? Um, yeah, so seawalls, the, the primary, or pretty much the sole purpose of um, seawalls is to protect the infrastructure and the property behind it. And that's usually at the cost of the surrounding shoreline, um, which can actually lead to um, passive beach erosion. And sometimes you'll see um, a seawall is called a hard armoring structure, basically, and you'll see the wall and then beach on either sides. And then right in front of the wall, there's nothing because everything is just eroded. And again, they're only temporary measures because you know eventually sea level rise is gonna top over that wall eventually. Um, so they're short term, they actually cause quite a bit of damage to the surrounding environment and people are going much more towards soft adaptation measures, excuse me, like um, living shorelines, uh, wetland restoration and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so some of what we may see as as parks start to adapt to sea level rise in particular is some managed retreat or some changes to the general plan so that parks are redesigned in the way that you're talking about, like maybe there are fewer campgrounds and um, we de-emphasize seawalls, for example. I, again, not speaking directly to Carpinteria or any specific park, but just to say that uh, we are gonna have to change the way that we use some of these parks because of um, the climate impacts that are coming. Um, and then I see um, some questions on um, the complexity between the final budget and the administration of a local a parks budget. Um, and I think um, it's a complicated question, but a lot of these projects are very complicated. So, you know, they get prioritized, a deferred maintenance project might get prioritized and then the permitting gets much more complex or they find something else when they um, open up the project that is gonna take a lot more money and time to fix. So these are, I think Bree's use of um, dynamic. These are very dynamic often and complex projects. So there is change, between the time that money gets appropriated in the budget and when it actually gets on the ground. And, um, and I think that's the rationale for why they cut the 31 million in deferred maintenance this year. Um, so that's a partial answer to your question. Uh, but we are almost out of time. And I want to, first of all, thank uh, all three of our speakers, Abigail, Bree, and Emily. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and uh, strategic perspectives with us. And um, I want to invite everybody to uh, continue the conversation on social media um, and to watch our emails and action alerts um, for specific advocacy, advocacy opportunities for the budget. Um, you can see on our um, on the screen right now are all our so social handles. So we'll hope to, um, to see more uh, questions and engagement from you. And again, if you had a, uh, a question that was not answered, um, we will be following up with some of these other answers um, after via email. And uh, with that, I will say good afternoon. It's great to see everyone. Thanks for coming. I hope you found it helpful. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Take care.